See, I could feel it building. When I was living in Chicago before the Democratic Convention happened, I could feel it like three or four weeks before that, I could feel this building. Oh, yeah. Now, in the police corps, I was a young cadet at the time, so uh, I was studying oh, right. a police, a police officer, uh -huh. and at the same time, I owned a head shop where I had all these hippies living, making candles for me. Oh, my so uh, here I was in these the police two... police yeah, yeah, of course, sure. My family, my mom and dad were both cops at that time. Oh, I see. And so I come from a family of Irish Italians. They were all either uh, know, well, priest, gym know. coaches, or cops. Uh -huh. <laughs> In Chicago, the Irish ran the... So were you from Bridgeport? No, Chicago. But what part of town? North Avenue and Pulaski. Uh, Smack dab in the middle of the city, about four blocks uh -huh. from Pioneer Savings and Loan. Uh -huh. Where my family is still at. My whole oh, really? family is still in that really? same block. Huh. I'm the only black sheep who moved down here. Uh -huh. But again, it was that that radicalized me. Because I was bouncing between there and here for a while. From 1966, I first came here, liked what it was, went back, came out here, went back, came out here, went back. And then that 1968 convention, I had my first major nervous breakdown because of that event. How old were you? You were born in 46? Yeah, I must have been, what, in my 19s or 20s, something like that. Okay. And you grew up in that neighborhood, which, what was it called? I don't know what the neighborhood would be called, but North Avenue and Pulaski is, was, North Avenue is a dividing line between the Hispanics and the blacks who are on the south side of that street. And on the north side of the street, you had Italian, Polish, and Irish, mostly, in that neighborhood. Now you got into the uh, cadets because, well, your parents were both... Well, my parents were both, you know, police officers at the time, uncles, relatives, nieces, nephews, you know. Irish-Italian neighborhood, you were either going to grow up to be a cop, a priest, a social worker, or, you know, or a garbage man. How long had you been doing it? Uh, I, I was just in the cadet training, so I hadn't done anything long. Before then, I was in what was called the Reserve Traffic Police, which was a part of the state state troopers program. And did you have brothers and sisters that did the same thing? No, actually my brothers and sisters grew up to do other things except one of my brothers was a professional cat burglar. He was, <laughs> he was <laughs> uh -huh. So we kept uh -huh. it in the family. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. Remove the, the cover. Uh -huh. Oh, take that off? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, you so then did you, did you um, um, Get in uh, conflict with your family, with your mom and dad, about this, what you thought about well, the No, not really. Actually, happened. my parents were very, very, very liberal. Uh -huh. uh, we were they upset about what the cops did at the convention? Uh, actually, they were. Uh, uh, it was divided. As I was telling Paul the other day, this, the thing that I find normal about my family is my mother and father never agreed on anything in our entire uh -huh. life. My mother was a liberal, and she worked in the steel workers' union after she left the police. She worked at Continental Can for 30 years doing work uh, establishing unions, as many women did. Uh -huh. My father was was just exactly the opposite. He was staunchly conservative and didn't agree. She was Lutheran. He was Catholic. <laughs> on and on. So and he on stayed and on and on. in the police force? No, he, he stayed for about seven years, and then he left and wound up becoming a vacuum cleaner um, designer, and then uh -huh. later became a Chicago bus driver because he liked the uniform. Uh. He, he couldn't stay out of uniform, he said, for very long, so he wound up becoming a bus driver, so he'd have a uniform. Yeah. But, but do you think that they uh, were influenced to leave the police force by the... My mother, my mother definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. Mm -hmm. And they saw what happened to me, definitely. Mm -hmm. They saw what happened to you, or they saw what happened in... They saw what happened to me, and they saw... And what how you felt, and how you yes. reacted. Because I, I was in the house, and I was an example mm -hmm. of what was actually mm -hmm. going on. How the rest of my brothers and sisters weren't that politically involved. How long did these event, events last? Because it was a week. Was yeah. a oh, quite a while. It started, it uh, like I said, for me, so for me, it started about three weeks before the Democratic uh, Convention uh, because August. the police department was sending out memos to all the various captains in all the all various districts yeah. saying that this is going to happen, get ready for it. You know, get your shields, get your badges, hide your badges. They don't hide your badges so people can't see who you are. Um, you know, all this little advice was being sent out, and to me, that advice was creating paranoia within the minds of the police officers. And I saw police officers do things two weeks before that dem that convention that I never saw. Like, uh, what did the memos say? 
Oh, the memos were saying, you know, that there's going to be this convention and a lot of people are going to be coming from California and stuff and they're hippie types and we should watch out and all these liberal left-wingers, you know, will probably be prone towards violence and so on and so forth. I can only paraphrase it in the way in which right. Mayor Daley himself said it. In the middle of the convention, he got up at the podium and he said, the police are not here to instill disorder, but to preserve it. Mm. That was a slip of the tongue that was really very true. And he and the police force had created a sort of a paranoia within the minds of the police before the people even got there. Mm. Now, I lived in Chicago my whole life up to that, and to go into a park and hang out at a park until midnight was very typical. There's nothing unusual about that. But then suddenly when the convention happens, the parks are closed at 10 o'clock at night and they're, they have police sweeping in to beat up and arrest anyone that's there. That was not typical of what happened there. So every maneuver that was being done by the police at that time was not atypical. It was not the way they did business before. It was atypical. Well, I say atypical, yeah, it was atypical. It was not the way they did business. So all of a sudden you've got police who are paranoid about the unknown. Mm -hmm. You got these kids coming from California who are extremely colorful, is the best way I could say, and are able to put on the most incredible show for other people. The first thing I saw when I went to Grant Park was they were going to roast a pig. And that was the first riot got started because they were threatening to roast a pig and so they were going to start a bonfire to roast an open pit pig and that of course got the police all fired up and then they started busting heads. Mm. So, and all it was was the people from California and from there who had come in there, they were just kind of putting on a show and they were, to me, they were just a bunch of big mouth people who were trying to overstate their purpose and, you know, I was taught to sit and listen. And the, well, the big issues at that time, for his benefit, what were they? Why were people even there? Well, why were people there? There was a peace movement going on in America before that, and people didn't want the war. And it was obvious that the Republicans were pretty much in charge of the country. And uh, even Eisenhower, didn't he warn us when he left office about the military-industrial complex? And I saw, here's what I saw. I saw two types of students protesting. There were those students who were auditing classes and whose parents sent them to college and they had a lot of money and nothing to do and they were the extreme radicals. And there were the other kids who were working for a living trying to get through college, and they were the ones that was pretty quiet about it all. And what happened is, during that convention and during that period of time, these people who were uncommitted, who were fairly conservative and working, became radicalized because they saw what was going on, and they thought that was unjust, and they very quickly went over to the other side. And so that's why you had this incredible fast motion <laughs> of, of, of what I would say uh, politicizing people almost overnight by discussing what was going on and then seeing the injustices that happened and seeing the way it happened. Also, you have to understand, Mayor Daley himself started out by fixing up, cleaning, and painting the area of the city where the Democratic Convention was going to be held. And that part of the city was dirty, filthy, scummy place. And then he practically puts up fences all over the place and turns it into almost an armed camp. The people in Chicago are wondering what's going on. So again, you have this fear of everybody doing business in a different way than we were used to, and the police force and all the powers to be getting geared up for what was going to be something like a, something like a storm coming. So they had that mindset. You told me uh, a couple days ago about going to the hotel or near Grand Park. Oh, that's you know, when I had you, my nervous breakdown. Can you recount what happened? What was the day? Was it? You remember what day it was and what time of day it was? Again, it was right across from the Hilton Hotel. I don't remember. It was about three or four or five days into it. I remember that. What I remember is hearing on the news that morning that Sonny and Cher were in court and were testifying and saying some things, you know, some radical things about how the war was unjustified and stuff like that. And then that night, everybody was gathered around the statue of out in front of the Hilton Hotel there. The park was right across the street from the Hilton. I had heard from my other cop friends that there were emergency services inside of the Hilton in case there was problems. And the police pretty much lined up the ones that were on duty 
arm to arm in front of the Hilton Hotel, all the way across and around the around the block with shields and bayonets ready. You know, I mean, uh, bayonets or batons. I mean, they're they're batons. And what happened was, I was sitting there uh, in the park, dressed up in plain clothes with my other hippie friends, and I saw a rabbi and a Catholic priest talking about 20 feet from me. And when the police came, they flanked on both sides, came coming from, what was that, the... Uh, I mean, from the other side, you mean? Well, they, the well the, the Hilton Hotel was here, and then from my right and from my left, they came in. So basically, we were surrounded on three sides by police, and they were boxing us in. And the two, the two forces on the outside were coming in towards each other, squeezing people into the park there. And if you just wanted to get out of there, go home. You had to go through the police line. So that was going to cause problems. And what happened is I saw clubs beginning to swing. And these two, police, these two uh, priests, obviously, dressed in priest drab. You can't, couldn't miss them, right? Here comes this wall of police swinging their batons. And they start beating the heads in of these two priests who were talking that didn't notice them come up behind them. And at that moment, something inside me went, there's something really wrong with this. I knew that the services um, for uh, first aid were at the Hilton, so I started running towards the Hilton Hotel to get help for all the bashed heads I saw to the left of me. And as I ran, I saw friends of mine who I'd gone to high school and grammar school with who were also police officers. We went, you know, we were going to the academy together, and some of them were already police officers, the uh, Parisi brothers, Joe Parisi and his brother, and and my friend Butch Nowicki were already cops, and they were in line. Uniform. Yeah, they were in uniform. So with their he with the helmets, which I'd never seen them geared up that way. So I did what anyone would do. I ran towards my friends. And as I started running towards them to see if I could get past them into the Hilton to get some services, I remember Butch Nowicki looking at me and not recognizing me. And I looked into his eyes and I did not see a human being. Mm. I saw a mad, crazy, rabid animal staring back at me. And at that point, he pulls out his gun and aims it right at me. Mm. And my mind just went, bing, just like that. Snapped in a second. I couldn't believe that somebody I had known most of my life, in that moment, was so panicked that they didn't even recognize who I was and was threatening to kill me. And I knew that if I had gone three more steps, he would have shot. Mm. He would have fired. And it was almost surreal because I stopped dead in my tracks. I could literally feel my mind kind of step back inside of itself mm -hmm. as I was going crazy. I could feel myself having a nervous breakdown. I was frozen with dread and there was this surreal bloodletting going on all around me. People being bashed and screamed and running in all directions and screaming and yelling and shouting. And I'm just standing there and time slowed down. Mm -hmm. And I'm watching this like it was a ballet. This is the most disgusting thing I've ever seen in my life. I slipped off sideways, went oblique, managed to break through the line where the, the police in front of the place and the police that were coming here, there was a little hole. I dodged through there like a trying to make a touchdown, got out of there, ran over to Wells and uh, to Wells and North Avenue where the, uh, where the business was that I had all these hippies, went in there to tell people, you won't believe what's going on there, this place, everyone's gone crazy, the police are mad dogs, the people are scrambling like crazy to get out of there and are being bashed for trying to leave. And just at that moment, the police surround that my, my shop <laughs> uh, because there's hippies in there and they threatened by it. So here I look out the window and there is a line of police completely around the shop. And at this point I just started drooling. I mean I just literally had um, kind of like an epileptic seizure. And I don't even really remember what happened after that because a day or so later I was in the hospital. Wow. You know undergoing medication. So that was my first major nervous breakdown.
Did you did you uh, get busted then? Did you find out later that you had been busted? No, nobody the in the place got busted. busted. The cops yeah. kept everybody inside the place to make sure that they wouldn't, they wouldn't be join the stuff joining what was going on. It was their way of blockading the few known hippies that they knew. They were hanging around in Piper's Alley. Well, that's you where you all the, the Luminaire Theater was there, you know, and that's where all the radicals hung out. Was basically on uh, up and down Well Street, in Oak Town. Right. And our shop was on North Avenue in Wells, right on the corner next door to Allen's Alley. And we were the only head shop in that area at the time. What was it named and what did you sell? You know, I can't even remember the name of it, right. except we called the place Paraffin Paraphernalia. We sold candles, black lights, uh, posters, uh, bumper stickers, which we made ourselves. And then I invented a bunch of candles. One of the candles I invented was the, the, strobe, the Buddhist strobe candle. And uh, we sold those, and they became pretty popular. So it was just a kind of a, a 60s head shop, which was mostly black light posters, uh, bumper stickers, uh, and candles. Today, I think people would call it a head shop where you'd have uh, pipes to smoke. We had out. pipes. We didn't have bongs back then, but we had pipes made out of different kinds of plumbing, of course. We had a lot of, in those days, Nehru jackets and dashikis were very popular. So people would always wear some kind of a pendant, and we were making peace pendants out of stained glass and things like that. What would happen is if some kid came in from out of town who was basically a transient hippie, needed a place to stay, they could stay there in the commune for free, and we put them to work doing something. So whatever talent they had, we'd have them develop something. The commune was in the building? The commune was in the building. Behind the, the store was where, where we all lived. Okay. It's on Wells. It was on North Avenue. It's on Northwest of Wells. Yeah, just uh, half a block or so. Yeah, it's still attached to the it. same building yeah. as Allen's Alley. Yeah. If you came out our yeah. door, went to the corner and around, you'd be in Allen's Alley. Mm -hmm. Best, best, best big pizza in town. <laughs> it's, it's all different now. Yeah, and that's where the Luminaire was, which was one of the first first radical theaters where we could go and see things like Andy Warhol films and you know and yeah. a lot of uh, European films. We were down the street from uh, the Ale House. Yeah. And, and uh, Oxford. Yeah, all those. There was millions of little shops along Well Street there that were you know there was yes. a lot of clothing stores. There were stores yeah. that had machines that you could, you know, that would spin paper and let you do things. So there were when, places that sold tie-dye. When he arrived, you said you hadn't seen him for 40 years. How did you two meet? We didn't meet. I'd just seen him around because I'd done a lot of things with SDS and with the Weather Underground and some of the students back in that time. When I came back out here, I was still, after my nervous breakdown, and I got, got myself back together, the first thing I did was join Gay Liberation and Women's Liberation Front here in San Francisco and started working with them to do some things, which was kind of interesting because they were having they were having a lot of trouble doing proactive uh, politics. And having come from this thing in Chicago, you know, my point of view was just go out there and shout at people. You know, go out and get noticed. Go yeah. get noticed. Right. Attorney Cunningham, sure. would you mind explicating a little bit, the, describing your experiences during the Democratic Convention? You had told me a, a month ago or so about living in that area. Or if you could explain it. Just well, I'd, I'd, um, we lived near Lincoln Park. We were in Lincoln mm -hmm. Park those first couple of nights and, you know, with the cops. And then, and, then, um, and then we were like, as neighborhood people, we were pissed off about the cops you know, right. being so rough in the park, in Lincoln Park. And yeah, they don't know, of course, yeah, Chicago Park, Lincoln we, Park was where the... Well, there's two different places, places where all this shit Grand Park and Lincoln one's Park. One's downtown right. and one's up on the north side. North side slightly, Park. right. And, and so we went to a bunch of us, you know, like family people, huh? went to the police chief, or the district Police chief. That's right. To complain about the way the cops act. I remember. And they're like, oh no, no, you know, that's all a mistake. We're not doing it, you know, blah blah. And, and they told us uh, they'd come and walk through the park with them that night, and make sure that they didn't, they weren't out of line. I remember. That the, was Tuesday. I remember the captain's name. His name was Captain DiGiacomo. 
Captain mm -hmm. Giamacomo. He was the head of that particular area of that police force. No, that no, covered no, Wall, Wall Street, isn't it? Brash. Clarence Brash. Oh. Okay. He later went to the jail. J yeah. For taking money. So did Butch Nowicki. Oh, did he? Yeah, he wound up killing he? people. Wow. He was using black kids as a front for him to steal things, and then he would recover them and take them back, and occasionally people didn't pay attention to him, he would kill them. And they finally figured that out. He, wow. was, he went to jail for murder. Wow. Big time case back then, too. Yeah, so if you could describe the setting here, uh, 1968, and what were you doing? And where were you living, address-wise? I was living Lincoln. on the north side, and, and I was just starting out as a lawyer. Yeah. Yeah, if you were in North Avenue and Wells, and you went towards the lake, you would eventually get to Lincoln Park area. Oh, yeah. Okay. So it was like the upper part, of, right. which I think they now call Newtown, don't they, that area? Uh, it's the upper, Newtown. upper, the upper old town is now called Newtown. Yeah, right. Were you there when, when Hugh Hefner got busted? I don't remember. Because I, I was in Lincoln Park well, at the time. Busted, it, you mean during the convention? Yeah, what happened is they were gassing the park to try to get everybody out of there, and Hugh Hefner showed up with a bunch of his girlfriends and was kind of la la around, sucking right. in his pipe because I was about a block away and recognized him, and the police again were flanking the thing and just busted his head. And, I don't, I don't remember and that became a big stink at the time because he yeah. was just standing around doing nothing and he, you know, had money and got lawyers uh, claiming that, you know, he wasn't even considered lo loitering, but they said he was loitering at the time and he didn't move, so that's why he got busted. Okay. Could you, uh, you know, you were giving me this description of it. you were out walking or something, or what did you expect? No, I did. We just, we, we, so we went through the park with them, and, mm -hmm. then, and then we were supposed to have another meeting with them, it caused us to leave from downtown the next day, just when this stuff was starting to happen That's right. in Michigan Avenue. Mm -hmm. And we went back up north, and, and uh, I forget what the hell happened then. It actually started around Lincoln Park. And it was in the late afternoon when they threatened to start a fire, a bonfire, and roast a pig. And that is and what happened is the police then started lining up. And then as people went towards the police to try to get past them, they noticed that they had all put their badges away and covered over their badges because some people were running around with pencil paper. And we're going to start writing down badge numbers so the police officers were becoming violent. And what happened is they couldn't, couldn't see them. So the police covered their shields. They, so they knew they were going to do what they did, okay? That's, that's the bottom line. They, they created that disorder on purpose. Okay. Well, well that's true. I mean, I, I think that, you know, it was, that was a planned thing, yeah. and it was instigated from the top, and the mayor said right. so, Absolutely. you know, in the spring, you know, nobody's going to come in Chicago and take over the streets of us. Correct. Yeah. You talk I mean, about the that Yippies people? really goaded them, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and um, if they weren't, that's just that kind of disposition that he's talking about of the cops where they just, you know, they, they get robotized. Yeah. And, um, but they, it's also like it's open season, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So there's stuff that happened in both parks on, on two, on three nights probably. Mm -hmm. It was pretty gross. Yeah. A lot of people got hurt. It was pretty intense. And you became an attorney for some of the people who were suing, is that who or who were arrested? I, I, or people who were arrested. Right. People who were arrested, I represented. And the fourth night, the, the last night, there was they were in front of the Hilton again, and they were going to march to the amphitheater, which is quite a ways away. And they told them they couldn't do it. And Dick Gregory got up and he said, "Well, we'll just march to my house." That's right. You know, and we go, right. and which would he would take them by there. But what they really didn't want was all those white kids to march into the black black neighborhood, neighborhood right? Exactly. And um, and so they stopped them. Right. At, at the, the National Guard stopped them at 18th right. and Michigan. Right. They put up a barricade. Basically. And and told them to turn back, and they didn't want to turn back, yeah. so they gassed them. Right. Earl Strayhorn. He later became a judge. Mm. And um, not even a bad one. It, it, but I, you know, I had gone there. I went right to the, I didn't even get to that corner. I went to the court. And, and then it's set up there until they start bringing people in. 
I missed a lot of actual events because I was trying to act like a lawyer. Mm. How many people did you get involved representing in these oh, cases? Man, there was hundreds. Hundreds of people were. People thousands, left town, thousands. everything was over. I mean, this other guy right. was sitting there, we had about three, four hundred cases. I mean, they were bullshit cases. You right. know, they were, but they, they, a lot of people didn't want to give in to them. Mm -hmm. and, and they went after everybody. I tried a lot of cases. No juries, they're all infractions. You don't get a jury trial. I had a wonderful uh, opportunity to cut teeth there. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of trials, cross-examined a lot of cops, a lot of hell from a lot of judges. Well, I have to say I was proud of the demonstrators, actually, because when the violence started, they were running around saying, no violence, stop, and they were pulling back. The police were becoming more and more hysterical, and the violence was beginning to escalate, and they were beating and smashing anybody that was in their way it for no totally reason at all. There was nobody, nobody attacked any right. police right. during that time. Oh. There, there was no example of it. And even during all even that, was the people were still movement. backing off and trying to get away, basically. They were not fighting the police. So it was so widespread, there were hundreds of cases. Oh, yeah. Thousands. Oh, there were arrest. probably, well, there were probably six, seven hundred people arrested in the five days. Not five that many, years. really, compared. there was more arrested here in 84. That's how many they could that pull off. That must have taken years to finish all the trials. No, no, you know, there, you know, there. There's no there, jury. They, they I would have You don't jury. have a jury, so it, you just go. Well, another thing, I would have checked the influx of the emergency rooms around there, because a lot of people got hurt that didn't get arrested. So if you add the injured and the lame to that, you're talking about thousands of people. Oh, really? people if only 600 were arrested, that's because that you know it was a chaos, and they were throwing them in the back of cars and taking them off. So but, at this time, and I don't know anything about it, but the, I would think, I mean, because stuff like that, at least that, not that I hear of, I don't think stuff like that happens now. I wonder if there are like oh. best practice rules, oh. like you know. Oh, well, it's just been a lot of places, places no. where a lot of that shit happened in Seattle about eight, nine years ago. That WTO happens. thing yes, up yes. there, yes. there yes. was a oh, lot. Just recently, and, yeah. And in Miami, just because of the Republican Miami. convention in in okay. uh, what either two thousand twenty oh four, I think. For me, the difference between the California police and the Chicago police is the Chicago police are a bunch of bullies and they know it and they act like pit bulls and they're not ashamed of that. Here, it's all spit and polish and they have the same temperament. Huh. They just pretend that they're following the rules, but deep down inside, they're just as paranoid and uptight in some cases. Well, it's getting so. to be more, you know, I mean, the, 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 the you can see it was happening as we speak in yeah. Pittsburgh. They've got, they've got people hemmed up a mile away from the place where the meeting is that right. they want to be protesting, protesting. at. And, uh, and uh, when they try to get out of there, they beat them up. What happened is the powers to be have learned how to handle some of this stuff. Well, that's what I'm much, saying. But they it still got, happens. They refine the techniques. They, they refine their techniques. Fences, yeah, exactly. They keep the distance. That was started in Chicago. They weren't going right. to let us get anywhere near Here, the that convention theater, yeah, you know? theater. Nowhere near. And I remember there was. I remember being in a negotiation beforehand with with the uh, one of the deputy mayors and. Uh, it was like, would they get a permit so they could go to a place where they could see the front? Right, right, see the building. building. Right, right. You know? yeah, right. And that was like a big you know, dividing line. Yeah. They couldn't, uh, they couldn't agree. I mean, they just don't want them really. Right. Much. Most of the people in Grand Park were being pushed towards the McCormick place, so they were being pushed in that direction. Yeah, so, they couldn't get, the so they couldn't get up town and away from the open. We talk about how it transitioned in Chicago to the Fred Hampton. Yeah, in a quick few minutes. Yeah, I mean it wasn't a long time, and and um, um, it just kept going. I mean, if you're thinking of the of of what happened, the reason that stuff happened in Chicago and it was because of the anti-war movement and because of the election that was coming up and because. Lyndon Johnson had abdicated right. after the Tet Offensive in mm -hmm. Vietnam, mm -hmm. and then um, um, King was assassinated, and then Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, 
and then it was clear that there was a major wing of the Democratic Party that was supporting the war, right. and that Hubert Humphrey was their candidate, yeah. and Bobby Kennedy was going to be the anti-war candidate, and he was killed, killed. and, and uh, so Eugene McCarthy was the anti-war candidate, yeah. and there was, and he was not, you know, the, the, the convention was clear, the convention was going to roll over that candidacy, right. and put Humphrey up against Nixon, which they did. And Humphrey lost. Mm -hmm. But the protesters couldn't have stopped that from happening. Could they? Well, they they wouldn't have admitted that mm -hmm. at the time. They thought they could influence it, and they thought they could carry the day for McCarthy, or some whole wing of them did. A whole other wing were more radical than that, and just you know wanted to fuck up the whole process because they the 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 view of stopping the war was not seriously entertained by the powers that be. It was clear that the country, the government, whoever was going to be president was going to keep on with the war. Keep on with the war. And we they'd just been stop. shown that they were going to lose it because of the tech. And, and we were they, wondering they, why there was this was overwhelming popularity did not want it to happen and everyone was wondering why we were so intimate. And and how, how could you have everybody in the country not want a war and then the people in charge keep doing it? Huh. Well, <laughs> so 40 obviously, years ago, 40 years sooner or later, passed, something goes. And 40 years later, we're still the same exact yeah, aren't we? Aren't we? Same, 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 same policies. Well, and it yeah, happened same. before. I mean, that's how we got into the Korean offensive and various things like that. You know, where, my, where I lost my dad and a lot of stuff. It was the same stupid politics. And a lot of my relatives recognize that. But what was different was the younger kids coming out of college at that time were much more idealistic. And they wanted to fix it now. And if they couldn't fix it through the system, which they didn't believe in, then they wanted to break it and replace it with something that worked. Okay? So that was basically the, the feeling of the people at that time. Now, uh, nobody was willing to engage in any kind of violent acts because everyone was really into Martin Luther King and Gandhi. And again, being idealistic, they wanted to do this with words and with the power of their persuasion. But that was the power to be, or they were bullies. Mm -hmm. They were bullies. I always say, if you're in a ring with a bear and the bear wants to eat you, there is no reason or amount of words or any argument you can give the bear that will stop them from eating you. So your job is protect yourself, get, or get out of there, or, or attack him. the bear. You have one of two choices. Either you kill the bear before he kills you, or you get the hell out of there. Or feed him. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you are Order the food. You realize you are the food. You realize you are the food. The bear doesn't know the difference in what you're handing him in your hand. Okay. Well, Dennis, I know you, you want to go. Uh, you have another appointment, whatever. And I appreciate it. I just wanted to have this connection. And, and actually, I did 